is uh, it's a little bit awkward because Father's Day was last Sunday, and I didn't get to preach, so I'm upset about that. So I've hijacked today, and I'm going to do another Father's Day message. Thank you. I needed that encouragement. I was thinking a lot about uh, what the Bible calls the Father's blessing. Oftentimes in the Bible, we see fathers blessing their kids. In the Old Testament, it was a tradition. It's part of their culture. And today, it's still a part of our culture that we bless our kids. But what do we mean when we say the blessing of a father? What are we looking for? There was a really good book written by Gary Smalley and John Trent a number of years ago. And they broke it down to five components of a father's blessing. What a father does to really bless his kids. And I'm going to go through those five components and give you some examples. So I would suggest, you know, you all have phones and you're pretty good. I see your little thumbs going back and forth, very high speed. I'm, I'm pecking, like, very carefully, one letter at a time. And I see your hands going over so speedily. So I know you're capable of taking notes. So this might be one of those times you want to take some notes. And the headings that come up on the screen are going to stay there for a while, so you're going to have the time to maybe take some notes. Because it's a very practical message, really, really practical message. So you get out of it what you write down, basically. So the blessing of the Father. Before the first one comes up, does anyone want to guess what one of the blessings of the Father might be? But what, what we do with our kids that makes a difference in a very practical way, hint, since the time they're first born. Right, right as babies, this begins. This, hmm? M much more practical. It's too easy. You, you, it, it's, it's, too, it's too obvious, I'm going to have to tell you. Um, touch, touch, physical touch, meaningful touch. How important is it? I, I wanted to know in human development, how important is this human touch, this physical touch? So I started researching it, and that, that's really easy. Uh, Siri, how important is uh, physical touch in the life of a baby? And this is what it, they came up with. Touch is central to human social life. It is the most developed sensory modality at birth. It contributes to cognition, brain, and socio-emotional development throughout infancy and childhood. I remember John talking about <clears throat> when they went to get Sam out, out of a Vietnamese orphanage uh, years ago as a baby. And uh, he had a massive blood tumor on the side of his face, which in that culture they took as deformation, they took as, uh, as a, a sign of, of demonic curse, like that this child is, is somehow doomed. He didn't get a lot of physical touch, really hardly any. And as a result, what he did to make up for that, to stimulate his brain to function and grow, was bang his head against the wall. And this is not uncommon. Babies do this. When they're not properly touched enough, they will find a way to stimulate their brains by simply smacking their head against something hard. So much so that he had to wear a helmet for part of his, part of his development. That's how important physical touch is. Human touch reduces, and this is not just for children, this is for everybody. Human touch reduces the stress hormone cortisol. When you get stressed, your body is flooded with cortisol. It's a fight or flight response, and it completely energizes you, and it's really, really hard to get rid of. I talked to my doctor about it when I was going through a bad time of pretty much constant stress, and he said, the only thing is <clears throat> you've got to run it off. It's an energy that's released into the body. You have to work it off. You need to do something. Go out for a walk. Go for a run. But physical touch helps to reduce the level of cortisol in our bodies. Isn't that interesting? And it's not just as children, it's as adults too. So that first one is meaningful touch. Anyone want to guess on number two? If touch is important, what else is important in human development? Yeah, who said voice? 
voice. A, a spoken word. A spoken word imparts worth. I looked up that and how does it fit into human development and this is what it said. And this is a surprise. Research shows that how and how much a parent talks and interacts with their child has a big impact on the child's success in school and life. And here's the part that really got to me. Children aren't born smart, they're made smart by their parents talking and interacting with them. The human brain, in order to develop, needs stimulation. Not just touch, but it needs to hear the voice and it responds to that voice and it begins to sort out information according to what's coming into it. The more you talk to a child, the more its brain is exercised. The more its brain is exercised, the more it develops. Isn't that interesting? Just, just talking to, to, to a child. Look, and it isn't just children. Lonely people that don't have human contact, that don't get a hug, that don't get talked to, their minds begin to slowly shut down. And their emotions become very stale and very dry. We need that contact. Okay, number three. How else does father bless the child? And that's a good one, eye contact, but it's not on, it's not on the list. Hmm? Nope. See, we're moving away from the physical now into something else. It's attaching a high value to the child. Some way of communicating with that child how much you value that child. It can be a whole lot of different ways. But let me just ask you this question. In our relationships with one another, how do we attach high value to another person? What are some of the ways that we have a behaving or speaking that communicates to that person, I really value you as a person. Spending time with them. Spending time with them absolutely is one of them. Listening. listening. Thank you, James. That was the first one on my list. Being a good listener. And that is, that is not just shutting up till you make your next point. You know, most of the time when we listen, we're just shutting up so we can make our next point. Really listening is, is listening to the person to try to figure out not just what are they saying, but what's going on inside of them while they're saying it. It's, a, it's an emotional sensitivity and not just an intellectual sensitivity. Give them your full attention. Okay, number two. Offer perspectives that address their present issues. Most of the time when we communicate, we're communicating because what's going... We, we're communicating because something's going on in our life, right? What's the first question you ask a person after you say hello? How are you doing? How are you doing? Because we tend to, divide, to, to, to define our well-being by what's going on in our lives, circumstances. So when someone asks you, how are you doing? If something's not right and you know them well enough, you just begin telling them, well, this is what happened and it's driving me crazy and blah, 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 blah. Offer them a, a perspective that addresses what is their present issue. And somebody else said spend time with them. Be kind and generous with your time and attention. Have you ever been so busy that the next phone call is going to enrage you? Like, like you've got so much to do that, that one more person asking you for some help is just over the line and the straw that's breaking the camel's back. Have you ever felt that way? I was telling uh, someone on the way to church, when I first started becoming a pastor, I was a lawyer too, so I had that legal practice and planting a church at the same time, which worked out to 60 to 80 hours of, of work a week. It was a full -time, two, two full-time jobs. And uh, I remember being in my back room and the phone ringing. I was walking down the hall and the phone was ringing and all of a sudden my stomach just clenched up and I felt that cortisol release of anxiety. Like, what's this? And, and I realized there's something, you know, something's wrong with that response. And as I was walking down the hall, my body physically stopped. I didn't choose to stop. It stopped. 
And I just stood there while the phone was ringing. And out of my left ear, I heard, not, I don't think I audibly heard it, I think it was a thought. This thought, strong thought came to me and it said, you know, when you, he said, you know, your yes has no meaning if you can't say no. Isn't that interesting? Your yes has no meaning if you don't know how to say no. And I realized in that moment, I don't know how to say no. I never say no. And it's eating up my life. Now, this is a tangent. has nothing to do with my point. In fact, it comes against my point of making time for people and being attentive to others. But that's one of the ways we ascribe worth. We can overdo it, get to the point where you can never say no. So there's a balance to be struck. But most of the time, we're so protective of our lives and of our time that giving someone else time when they're in trouble is just not something we want to do. Yet when we do it, it just makes an absolute world of difference. Okay, this next one. This next one I was thinking about this morning in our pre-service pre prayer time recognize their best qualities and affirm them and draw them out. And here's the thought that came in the pre-service prayer. I was thinking about uh, what would our church be like? What would this community be like if every single time you guys or anybody came to church, you ended up being affirmed in some way as to who you are, how you're doing with God, and your value as a person? Like, think about it, you guys, for a minute. Think about it. If every single time you came here, someone affirmed you in some way on one of those points, how you're doing, what you're like, what your talent is, what your giftedness is, if that happened every time you came to church, for every single one of us, what would that do to your life and what would that do to our community? What would, I mean, you'd be like, I want to go to church so bad. I just want to go to church because it's affirming. I want to be a. I, I need that encouragement in my life. I need to know I make a difference to somebody. We haven't seen James for, gosh, James. James had to move his job up to Costa Mesa. Took a really good job up there. Got a great promotion. But we, we lost him. We lost him from our fellowship. We lost him from our connect group on Wednesday nights. And people would keep saying, you know, are we ever going to see James again? just miss James. And uh, we all miss James. And James wandered in here unannounced, did not let us know. We did not have time to get a cake. He really just <laughs> bombed this service. And he walked in and it was just like a ray of sunshine. It was just like it's a moment of joy. So good to see you again. It really is, James. It really is. If we had that kind of affirming fellowship where we were that way with one another, constantly seeing what God's doing in them and how they're growing and changing, and we told them that every time they came, or one person told at least one other person in the room, and we had a culture that was like that, this would be a place so filled with the presence of God, it would be thick like fog. Just be, he'd just be everywhere hanging in the air. Affirm their character and their talents, which is saying the same thing. Okay, number four. Picturing a specific future for the child. Having what we would call it in you know, biblical terms, like having a vision for them. A sense of who this person can be. This is what this person can be. The father sees a talent or an aptitude in the child. It may be an actual job or a calling, like I sense my child's going to become a doctor or an engineer or a, a successful businessman or, or a pastor or something. Seeing their future in a positive way. Now, we, I, I've got, I wrote down here, care must be taken because not every dream a father has for his child is God's choice. We can often, you know, slot them, or oh, you're, you're going to be a this or you're going to be a that, and then we push for that, and it doesn't work because that's not God's calling. So there's a spiritual discernment of who is my child made to be? What, Father, what's, what's her destiny? What's her future about? 
and without manipulating, if we get a sense of that, we have to encourage that. That has to be something we go to bat for for them, to speak that affirmation into them, to, to support their dreams and, and, and what they sense for their future. That's a father's job. It's a mother's job too, but it's a father's job. So this is where prayer and hearing God's voice is essential. If no clear guidance has come, just focusing on a successful life and a successful relationship with God is something you can positively affirm all the time. Where your child has a particular goal, you know, everyone's born with a dream. Everyone's born with some... No, no, no child says, when I grow up, I want to be mediocre. When I grow up, I, I, I just want to get by. When I grow up, I want to go on welfare. No child has a dream like that. They have big dreams. They have something they hunger for, some expectation. Ask them what it is, and then help them for it. I like to watch football uh, a lot. It's a problem. And I even come to watch, uh, I don't just watch football, I watch stuff about football. It's even worse. And one of the things on the NFL channel is called uh, a football life. A football life. And they, they look at some player or some coach, and they take their, their development right from their toddling, and they all show little pictures, you know, like they've got the little snapshots on the screen of them as little toddlers holding a football that's bigger than they are. And you think, yeah, I guess that kid's going to become a football player. And they go through their development as a person and the de development as a player. I can't tell you how many times the interviewer asks and says, what was the key factor in you becoming a successful football player? They have one of two answers. It's either my mother believed in me, and even though we grew up poor and didn't have much money, she made sure I got the uniform. She made sure I got to practice. She believed in me. That's the first answer, most common. Second one is, my father believed in me, and he did it, and he got me there, and I am who I am because of who they believed me to be and what I could do. And they, they sacrificed, sacrificed for my future. I hear that in those interviews over and over and over again. Without that encouragement, that child is not going to grow up to be successful because life is too hard. You're going to need that. Okay, I'm going to tell you a personal story. Um, when I was uh, 12 years old, going into what we called in Canada junior high, which today would be like middle school, they did a bunch of aptitude tests on me in elementary school. And uh, the counselor called me in and said, the results of your tests are that you shouldn't go to university. You shouldn't expect to go to university, and you should probably go to a technical school and get a trade. And uh, I came home, and I told my father, I said... Um, about to go into middle school, and they say that I should not take an academic route. I should go to a trade school. And my father said, no, that's not what's going to happen. He said, you aren't stupid, you're lazy. <laughs> he said, you aren't stupid, you don't know how to study. And I thought, no, I have no clue. I don't bother with it. Why would I? It's not fun. My father said, so here's what we're going to do. And I'm, when I tell you this right now, I am not exaggerating, okay? My father said, here's what we're going to do. And this was the summer. You know, out, school's ending, they do this. Now it's September, this is where you should be going with your future. Summer. You are going to stay home for a year. You are going to be in your bedroom for a year. You are going to learn how to study. And he meant it, and that's what happened. I was put in my room after dinner. I, there was no TV. There was no radio. There was no nothing. There was books that I had to read. And the first one was a social study textbook. 
It was, about, it was too wide, too high, and too thick. It was on market gardening in the St. Lawrence River Valley of Canada. <laughs> so he said, you're going to learn to study. I didn't know how to study. I, had, I didn't know what to do, but I could read. Not very well, but I could read. So this thought came to me. Oh, by the way, when he first did this, the first month or two, I would look out the window and I would see my brother in the front yard, my younger brother in the front yard with all of our friends playing football and, and doing sports and having fun while I was locked in my room. And I remember being so depressed and unhappy that I was lying on my bed and I was crying, just crying and crying out to God, you have to make me smart. You have to make me smart. And I begged him to make me smart. And I don't know how this thought came, but I realized I, I need to learn to study. I don't know how to do it, but... And no one helped me. My father didn't sit me down and say, this is how you learn to study. He just locked me in the room. So I took the social study textbook, and I read the first page. And after I read the first page, I closed the book and tried to remember what was on the page. And I had a hard time with that. So I went on to read the next page, page two, and I read what was on the next page, and then I tried to remember what was on the first page, and I couldn't. So I went back to the first page and read the first page again, and then read the second page again, and then turned to the third page and read the third page, and then tried to remember what was on the second page and what was on the first page, and couldn't. So I went back and started again and read the first page again, the second page again, the third page again, the fourth page again, then the fifth page, and you can understand what I was doing. It took me, I don't know, a, a month or two to read that textbook, but when it was done, I knew where everything was on every single page. And I have had an almost photographic memory ever since. <laughs> Guys, I'm not exaggerating. The recall of anything I've read is absolutely incredible from years ago. It'll just come up in my mind when I'm thinking about a subject. I wasn't born smart. I was made smart. And I thought, you guys, that that was the cruelest thing my father ever did in my life was lock me in that room for a year. But by the end of that first year of middle school, I was on the honor roll. And I stayed on the honor roll for the rest of my career. So what looked like the meanest possible thing he could do turned out to be the absolute best thing that he could do. I don't, e I don't think he enjoyed it either. I don't think he wasn't cruel. He just was wise. Just wise. Number five, make an active commitment to the fulfilling of the dream. And that's what my father did for me. He made an active commitment in action to the fulfillment of the fact that his son is not going to be stupid or accept that he's not smart. So this active commitment that a parent makes, guys, it can be any sacrificial act for the child's success. It could even mean, I know families that have re relocated and gone to a different city so that their child can go to a particular school. Saving for a college fund by giving up the new car. Delaying retirement, coaching his or her sport, traveling to training events, or maybe just being at every game. I know adults that I've talked to, particular guy I'm thinking of. His father was never at any of his games, ever. Too busy with something else. What does that communicate to the child? You don't matter. This is more important. Okay, this is where this all gets interesting, okay? That was an interesting introduction. Now the message. Some of you might be thinking, this all just sounds like child psychology. It's just like child psychology. Does this have anything to do with God, and does this have anything to do with the Bible? Well... Let's look at how God fathered Jesus. Because Jesus 
interestingly, was God, but he was also perfectly human. So he had all the same perfectly human needs that we have. He needed to be fathered well in order to become who he was destined to become. So let's look at this incident in Jesus' life because it's, it's really quite amazing. This is Jesus' baptism. So I'm going to read it to you. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. What was our first point? Blessings of the Father. What was the first point? Touch. And the Spirit came down and landed on him. What was the second one? And God spoke and said, this is my son. And what's the third one? Affirmation and ascribing a high value. And the father said to Jesus, this is my son whom I love. That's ascribing that high value. With him, I am well pleased. In one incident, one short encounter, Father God saw to it that Jesus was affirmed as to his identity as his son, ascribed high value to him, and that he is pleased with him. So ask yourself, I mean, yes, Jesus is God and, and all that, but he's also fully human. He's about to embark on an adventure for the purpose of his life, fulfilling the dreams of the Father for him and the calling that's on his life. But before he goes and does one miracle, before he goes and speaks one message, before he obeys anything like that on that track, he has to know who he is and how the Father feels about him. His identity needs to be completely affirmed in that with the blessing of the Father. So that comes before any ministry happens. So from that point on, Jesus' ministry becomes a ministry not of initiation, but of response. Because everything he's received that he needs to do it, he has already received. Isn't that interesting? The spoken word, he heard a real voice. He was touched by the Holy Spirit. High value was described to him when his father said, you are the one that I'm well pleased with. The words spoken communicate three essential things necessary for a father's blessing. The first one, acknowledge his identity. You are my son. The second, you are the object of my loving affection. And three, you please me. There are no more affirming words that can be spoken in a person's life than to hear those three things. How important to Jesus was his identity as the Father's Son? How important was it? What happens, what happens right after his baptism? Like, the next story, what is it? He's in the desert for 40 days of fasting in tremendous physical weakness, which is going to set him up for one important encounter, and who is it with? Satan. Satan. We wonder why things get hard when we become a Christian. My life was so much easier when I wasn't a Christian. Now I'm a Christian, it gets really hard. It's supposed to get hard. The enemy's after you. What does he want to do? What does the enemy want to take away from you? He wants to take away the Father's blessing. He wants to take away your identity, your calling, the high value God has given you. And Jesus gets to go through this before we go through this. There it is. So he's weak. He hasn't eaten And what does Satan begin by saying? What, 
What, what, what is the first thing that Satan says to Jesus? First sentence. If you are the Son of God. He's just had this, 40 days ago, he just had this amazing affirming, affirming experience where God told him who he was and how important he was to him and loved him and touched him and spoke to him and affirmed his identity. And the first temptation Jesus faces after that is one thing. If you're really the Son of God, he wants to take Jesus' identity away from him. And in the lives we live, the devil has the same agenda. If he can talk you out of the Father's love, if he can talk you out of the Father's affirmation, you've lost the thing that you need most for survival. Are you with me? Do you get it? See, whatever he went, the, the Bible tells us, Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every single way that we're tempted. He didn't sin, but he went through the same garbage in his development as, as a person as we have to go through. And this was his first test. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. But here's Satan's trick. If you are the Son of God, casting doubt, like, are you really the Son of God? Do you really think that you're the Son of God? Then you need to prove it by doing something powerful. Is that what he said? Like, come on, do a miracle. Look, this is an even bigger temptation. Because here's the deal. This applies to every single one of us. God speaks something wonderful to you. He affirms your identity in Him. He affirms your childhood in Him. And that should be enough. But then the devil comes along and says, Oh, really? You really think he feels that way? You really think you're, you know, you're, you're close to God? Do something to prove the Father said to you. See, it's not enough that the Father said it to you. You need to prove it. You need to do something to show that you're really tight with God, to show that you're really His, his Son, that He really said that to you. The minute you have to do something to prove that it's the case, it means you don't believe what He said. Is the word of the Father to you of, of affirmation, is that enough? Or do you have to earn it somehow and prove it somehow by doing something else? Are you with me? And the minute we get sucked into that temptation and begin trying to prove it, we are doubting it. His word is not enough. I have to do something beyond what he said. Are you with me? It's kind of like this. The blood of Jesus assured you of your salvation, but now you have to do something greater than the blood of Jesus to prove it. Are you getting it? And that thing that we must do in excess of hearing the Father is religion. Rules and rituals that if we keep, we can be assured of the Father's love because what He said to us isn't good enough. So we enter into a life of striving to prove something that's already been promised and said. Hello? Now, do any of you find yourself doing that? Am I the only one here that does that? Come on. We have to live free of that. We have to live in the promise of the Father without having to earn or buy or prove the promise of the Father. And if He has touched you with His Holy Spirit, and if He has spoken words of love to you, and if He has affirmed you, isn't that enough? Isn't that enough of our, to prove our identity? Do we really have to go beyond that with something extra? I'm thinking of a song right now. We sang it three weeks ago. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We don't have to add anything to the blood of Jesus. It's adequate. It's perfect. It did it. It did the job. We don't live a life of earning His love. We live a life because we respond to His love. You with me? You are not a Christian because you're good. You're good because you're a Christian. Never switch the order. 
It isn't being good that gets his love. You're only good because of his love. That's grace. That's the gospel. Jesus had to go through that with the devil. Had to get that nailed down and figured out before he did anything else. Now, the last two aspects of the Father's blessing, picturing a specific future for the one being blessed and an active commitment to fulfilling that blessing, they're seen in God's continual revelation to Jesus and his disciples of Jesus' role as Messiah and King, proven by the power of authority that God gave Jesus without measure. Through the miracles of the Holy Spirit, Jesus did through the Holy Spirit, the Father shows his active commitment to fulfilling the blessings that he has spoken to Jesus. Okay, look. If Jesus needed this blessing, and he did, how much more do you need it? Come on. If Jesus, sinless, perfect human, in his humanity needed these blessings, needed this affirmation, needed the touch, needed the voice, needed the attributing high value to. If he needed these things, how much more do you? How much more do we? Stephanie, when she introduced The announcements, she said something really interesting. She said how touched she was in worship. Interesting that we would use the word touched. Do you know we use uh, the word about the Holy Spirit, about God, we use the word touch more than any other word. He really touched me. I was really touched by that. I really felt his touch. <laughs> you felt his touch because he did. This was an imagination. The thing that happens in worship where you sense his love and you feel touched by his heart, that's actually happening. That's the Holy Spirit doing what the Holy Spirit loves to do. Do you know that when the word that, that the Father spoke over Jesus, he said, this is, this is my son, this is the one I, I love. The word, the Greek word used for love there is, it, it, it can be translated like this. This is my son, whom I have natural affection for. It's the word we would use for the love of a baby, where it's, it includes physical, like this, this is the one I want to touch. This is the one, like when I kiss my dog and pet her head. That's the kind of love. I know it's stupid, but when you don't have kids, you take it out on an animal. There's this affectionate touch. There's this desire just to hold and to touch and to cherish and to express love to. That's the kind of love the Father had for Jesus in that moment that he was affirming him for. And here's what's really cool. That same kind of love, that same Greek word for love is used later when Jesus says to us, this is how the Father loves you. You are the object of his natural affection. He wants to touch you. He wants to hold you. He wants to be close to you. He wants you to enjoy him. He wants you to rest in his arms so that he can express that kind of fatherly love to you because it makes him happy, not just you. Are you with me? Do you get it? You have to start letting God love you. And the devil will say, there's no good reason for that. You shouldn't be doing this. And you just say, shut up. Because it pleases the Father when I let him love me because he has an infinite Father's heart that needs to be expressed. So I'm not going to deny Father the chance to love me because you think I'm not worth it. And I say to him many times, I've said to the devil, you're absolutely right, I'm not worth it. But fortunately, it has nothing to do with that. That's not the issue here. The issue is God wants to love me, so I'm not going to deny him the opportunity. Don't deny God the opportunity to do what he loves to do. Now, here's my other application. Well, come here. Stand up. We already did this once, but <laughs> James, I'm so glad you're here. 
That's touch. That's the touch. And I whispered in your ear, thank you, James. I'm so glad you're here. That's the word. And James. James was part of our Wednesday night group for more than a year. I'm not sure I've seen anybody change as much in a year as James changed. You've really grown, James. You've really grown. Why don't we just take every opportunity we can to, to, to lovingly touch and embrace one another and speak words of affirmation to one another, words of identity to one another, messages from God and affirmation to one another. Let's be the kind of place where nobody leaves here without getting some affirmation, some human contact, some kind of love. Can we just, that's a simple thing. It's not that hard to do. You just have to risk being a bit emotional, you know, which is great. Nothing better than being a little bit emotional. feels great. Let's be that kind of place, all right? Good Lord, 15 minutes early. What are we going to do with 15, 16, 17? What are we going to do with 17 minutes? How about this? Yeah, let's just do this. This is going to be really cool. Why don't you all stand up? This just came to me. I think it's the Lord. <laughs> Come on. Stand up. All right. Here's what I like to do. I call it a crowd scan. All right? A crowd scan. You just do a 360 slowly, and you just kind of look around, and what will happen is your gaze will lock on somebody. You'll just pause and it'll click onto somebody. Happens a lot. And when it clicks on somebody and you look at them, that is the person you are to affirm. That is the person you're to walk over to. And you, I mean, it can just be a hug or, or uh, you know, bless you, uh, God blo loves you. I mean, it doesn't have to be some mighty word of God like you're going to invent a new medicine that will change Mark and give him hair. <laughs> Which would be good, which would be good. But it doesn't have to be that. It can be little. It, it doesn't matter how big it is. It just matters that we do it. So the Holy Spirit has an interest in that kind of fellowship. He has an interest in those kind of uh, responses and, and encounters, which means that right now we can trust him for his guidance. So as you do a crowd scan, you're going to see somebody, and you may not even know him. I mean, it might be a total stranger. Then just go bless them with God loves you, and I'm glad you're here. I mean, whatever it is, something will come to your mind. But let's take this as a little clinic and try doing it and see what happens. Are you with me? Okay, get ready for crowd scan. Now just start kind of kind of going, just drift across the room and wait and see where your gaze stops and then go affirm that person in some way. All right? Come on, guys. Take it seriously. Let's go. 